the murder of Julia Wallace. On January 19, 1931, in Liverpool, England, a seemingly routine evening took a dark turn for the Wallace household. Julia Wallace, a British housewife, was home alone at 29 Wolverton Street. Her husband, William, a mild-mannered insurance agent, had gone to his regular chess club meeting. As soon as he arrived, he received a curious message left by a man named Qualtro, instructing him to visit 25 Menlove Gardens East the following day. Presumably, it was to discuss an insurance policy or perhaps his latest chess move. Hoping for some excitement in his life, William set out to meet the man, leaving Julia behind. Apparently, she wasn't into discussing life insurance policies and chess strategy. As he searched for the address, he soon discovered it didn't exist. Frustrated at having wasted nearly an hour, he returned home to a horrifying scene. Julia's lifeless body lay on the floor, brutally beaten. It looked like another locked room mystery, as the police found no evidence of a break-in. They quickly turned their attention towards William. They theorized that he had orchestrated the entire scenario, including leaving the fake message for himself. They pointed to the call, which had been made from a phone box just a few hundred yards from his chess club. While the evidence was largely circumstantial, William was arrested, convicted, and sentenced to death. But just before our mild-mannered insurance agent was sent to the gallows, the Court of Criminal Appeal, not exactly known for their clemency, reviewed the case and found enough doubt to overturn his conviction. William was set free to return to his chess club, and while the police continued to investigate, no one else has ever been charged with Julia Wallace's murder. The identity of the mysterious Qualtro remains unknown. The Murder of Geli Raubal In the shadowy corridors of Nazi Germany's early days, a tragic and controversial death cast just another dark veil over Adolf Hitler's rise to power. The mysterious circumstances surrounding the death of Geli Raubal, Hitler's niece, have fueled speculation and intrigue for nearly a century. It was 1931, and the city of Munich was a hotbed of political activity, with the Nazi party gaining momentum. In a grand mansion on Prinz Regentenplatz, Geli Raubal lived under the watchful eye of her half-uncle, Adolf Hitler. The mansion, with its opulent yet austere decor, became the backdrop for a scandal that would haunt Hitler's legacy. Gailey, a vivacious young woman, was both adored and controlled by Hitler. Known to call him Uncle Alfie, she was frequently seen by his side at public events. However, behind the closed doors of the mansion, their relationship was rumored to be fraught with tension and possessiveness. The actual nature of Gailey Raubal and Adolf Hitler's relationship remains a mystery. The stories that surrounded the two suggested a forbidden love affair, scandalous sexual meetings, and a relationship riddled with jealousy. Though the stories might have been just that, there's no doubt they each had some semblance of truth to them. At the very least, Hitler was infatuated with his half-niece, and there is also very little doubt that she returned at least some of the affection. As for their tumultuous relationship, that story also is more or less true. Many who knew the pair claim that there was a constant air of jealousy surrounding them. Hitler's over Gailey's beauty, and the numerous men she flirted with, and Gailey's over Eva Braun, a young model employed by Hitler's photographer, who she felt fond over her uncle Alfie. It was this jealousy that many believe drove Hitler to become overly possessive of Gailey. While they lived under the same roof, he controlled her social life, dictating whom she could date and when, and preventing her from applying to music school in Vienna. On the night of September 18, 1931, following an argument with Hitler, Gailey was found dead in her room from a gunshot wound. The gun used belonged to Hitler, and though her death was officially ruled a suicide, the circumstances were suspicious. Reports of bruises and a broken nose suggested a struggle, and no suicide note was ever found. Apparently out of town at the time of Gailey's death, Hitler was informed the next day. According to Nazi leader Rudolf Hess, who broke the news, Hitler fell into a deep depression. He remained practically comatose for days, talking about ending his own life. 
When he eventually emerged from his haze, Adolf Hitler was by all accounts a different person. Though he'd never been kind, he was, if anything, crueler, even to his own family. He kept Gailey's blood-stained room as a shrine to her, filling it twice a year with flowers to commemorate her birth and her death. A scandal erupted with speculation that Hitler himself might have been involved in Gailey's death. Journalists who attempted to investigate faced severe repercussions, and one such journalist was executed at Dachau after being arrested by the Nazis. The truth about Gailey Raubal's death was buried along with her, overshadowed by Hitler's political machinations. Whether a tragic suicide or a murder, the case remains a chilling footnote in the annals of history, a mystery intertwined with the rise of one of the world's most infamous dictators. The Big Grey Man of Ben McDewey High in the remote Scottish Highlands, a legend persists that chills even the hardiest of mountaineers. The Big Grey Man of Ben McDewey, or Fear Lieth More, is said to haunt the mist-shrouded peaks of the Cairngorms, instilling fear in those who dare to venture there. It is reported to be very thin and over ten feet tall, with dark skin and hair, long arms and broad shoulders. Think Bigfoot's cousin. The first recorded encounter dates back to 1889 when Professor Norman Colley allegedly saw it. Though he technically didn't see it, rather he heard what sounded like footsteps before running away. Let's let Professor Norm tell the story himself. Here he is in 1925 describing his creepy encounter to the Cairngorm Club. I was returning from the Cairn on the summit in a mist when I began to think I heard something else than merely the noise of my own footsteps. Every few steps I took, I heard a crunch, and then another crunch, as if someone was walking after me but taking steps three or four times the length of my own. I said to myself, this is all nonsense. I listened, and heard it again, but could see nothing in the mist. As I walked on, and the eerie crunch, crunch, sounded behind me. I was seized with terror and took to my heels, staggering blindly among the boulders for four or five miles, nearly down to Rothy Mercus Forest. Whatever you make of it, I do not know. But there is something very queer about the top of Ben McDewey, and I will not go back there again myself, I know. But let's not just go by Professor Norm's account. This big gray man was apparently seen by numerous people over the years, including naturalist and mountaineer Alexandra Union. Union not only claims to have seen the gray man, but opened fire from his pistol as soon as he did. While his quick draw behavior seems at odds with identifying yourself as a naturalist, we'll just go with it. Most of the skeptics, and there are plenty, suggest the sightings are nothing more than hallucinations caused by the thin mountain air or even optical illusions like the Brock Inspector, where a person's shadow is cast onto clouds, creating a ghostly image. But whatever the explanation, scientific exploration and curious adventurers continue to explore Ben McDewey. The stories of the big gray man becoming part of the mountains enduring mystique, which has firmly embedded itself into the cultural fabric of the highlands, and when you combine it with the Loch Ness Monster and ghosts in the Black Mausoleum, it's starting to seem like it's part of the fabric of Scotland itself. The Hestalen Lights In the remote Hestalen Valley of Norway, a mysterious phenomenon has puzzled scientists and captivated the public for over a century. The Hestalen Lights ethereal orbs that dance across the night sky, defy explanation and challenge our understanding of the natural world. The Hestalen Valley, nestled in the heart of Norway, is a tranquil landscape of rolling hills and serene beauty. But as night falls, this peaceful setting transforms into a stage for one of the world's most perplexing light shows. Bright white and yellow lights hover above the ground, flickering and moving in ways that baffle observers. The lights have been documented as far back as 1811, but it was in the early 1980s that their frequency peaked, 
with nearly 20 sightings reported each week. Despite numerous scientific investigations, including cameras and observational studies, the light's origins remain elusive. Theories range from car headlights and atmospheric reflections to more exotic explanations involving plasma or other unknown natural phenomena. Researchers have noted that the lights often move against the wind and can change speed and direction abruptly. Their unpredictable behavior has made it difficult to study them systematically, adding to the mystery. The most intense period of sighting saw a flurry of scientific activity in Hestalen. Researchers from around the world flocked to the valley, hoping to unlock the secrets of the lights. Despite sophisticated equipment and rigorous methodologies, the phenomenon defied all attempts at a definitive explanation. Over the years, the frequency of sightings has diminished, but the Hestalen lights continue to intrigue. Occasional reports keep the mystery alive, drawing new generations of scientists and enthusiasts to the valley. Each sighting renews the sense of wonder and curiosity that has surrounded the phenomenon for so long. The Disappearance of Benjamin Bathurst In the turbulent times of early 19th century Europe, the sudden disappearance of a British diplomat sent shockwaves through the continent. Benjamin Bathurst's vanishing act remains one of the most perplexing mysteries of its era, shrouded in political intrigue and danger. It all started in November 1809, in the small German town of Perleburg, a frequent stopping point for travelers navigating the treacherous landscape of Napoleonic Europe. Benjamin Bathurst, a young and promising diplomat, found himself here resting before continuing his trip under the assumed name of Coke. The town, with its quiet streets and modest inns, seemed an unlikely setting for such a grand mystery. Bathurst was returning from a diplomatic mission in Austria, his journey fraught with peril as he sought to evade the French forces. Armed and cautious, he planned his route meticulously. On November 25th, Bathurst and his aide, Herr Kraus, prepared to leave their inn after a brief stopover. Bathurst stepped outside first, intending to inspect the horses. Moments later, when Kraus followed, Bathurst had vanished without a trace. The ensuing investigation was exhaustive. Bathurst's wife spent a fortune on search efforts, employing dogs to scour the countryside. Articles of his clothing were found, but his body was never recovered. Speculation ran rampant. Was Bathurst captured by the French, murdered by bandits, or did he simply vanish into thin air? The mystery deepened as reports surfaced of sightings and strange occurrences. Bathurst's disappearance became a topic of international intrigue, with theories ranging from espionage to supernatural abductions. The lack of concrete evidence only fueled the speculation as each new lead ended in a dead end. Despite the relentless search efforts and the involvement of high-profile individuals, Bathurst's fate remained unknown. The prevailing opinion is that he was either arrested by the French and later killed in prison, or was simply another victim of the bandits who made traveling through Europe during the 19th century a risky proposition. As history marches on, the story of Benjamin Bathurst continues to captivate the imagination. His vanishing act, set against the backdrop of the wars in Europe, became one of the era's most talked about mysteries, a puzzle that is unlikely to ever be solved. The Lost Sublet Mine In the rugged Guadalupe Mountains of West Texas, the legend of a hidden treasure has tantalized fortune seekers for generations. The lost sublet mine, said to contain a vein of gold so rich it defies belief, remains an elusive dream for those who dare to search for it. This fantastic tale begins in the late 19th century. Ben Sublet, an aging prospector with a reputation for wild tales and heavy drinking, claimed to have discovered a gold mine of incredible value. Sublet, often dismissed as a drunkard, stunned the other patrons at the bar when he walked into the tavern and threw down a handful of gold nuggets, declaring that drinks were on him. When his fellow drunks attempted to follow him to the mine, they were met with the business end of his rifle, as Sublet guarded his secret fiercely, even from his own family. Unfortunately, or perhaps unsurprisingly, the secret of the mine's location died with Sublet. 
All he left were rumors and a single shallow hole in the ground as evidence of its supposed existence. Over the years, numerous expeditions have been launched to locate the lost sublet mine. Treasure hunters and geologists alike have scoured the Guadalupe Mountains, driven by the tantalizing possibility of unimaginable wealth. Yet, the mine has remained stubbornly hidden, a part of local lore, a story passed down through generations. Despite advances in technology and the persistent efforts of modern-day treasure hunters, the mine's location remains one of the great unsolved mysteries of the American West. The Aurora Incident In the spring of 1897, the small town of Aurora, Texas, became the unlikely site of one of the earliest and most intriguing UFO incidents in American history. The Aurora incident, involving a mysterious airship and its extraterrestrial pilot, has sparked decades of speculation and debate. Aurora, a quiet farming community in North Texas, was a place where life moved at a leisurely pace. But on the morning of April 17, 1897, that tranquility was shattered by a sight that defied explanation. A cigar-shaped craft, metallic and gleaming, appeared in the sky moving slowly from south to north. The townspeople watched in awe as the craft drifted towards the property of Judge J.S. Proctor. The strange airship, unlike any balloon or dirigible of its time, seemed to be in distress. As it descended, it collided with a windmill on Judge Proctor's land, resulting in a catastrophic explosion. Debris was scattered over several acres, destroying the windmill, an adjacent water tank, and the judge's flower garden. Amid the wreckage, the townspeople discovered the remains of the airship's pilot. The body, though severely injured, was clearly not human. Speculation about the pilot's origin ran wild, with some suggesting it was a Martian. Papers with strange, indecipherable writing were found among the debris, adding to the mystery. The townspeople gave the mysterious pilot a proper burial in the local cemetery, marking the grave with a stone that bore a crude image of the airship. This act of respect for the supposed alien added a poignant touch to the already bizarre incident. Most of the remaining wreckage from the crash was buried in the nearby well, located under the damaged windmill. Over the years, the story of the Aurora incident has grown into a legendary tale. Skeptics have argued that the incident was a hoax, possibly concocted to revive the town's fading fortunes. However, many residents and UFO enthusiasts believe in the authenticity of the event, and occasional expeditions have sought to uncover more evidence. Whether a hoax or a genuine encounter, it has left an indelible mark on the town of Aurora and the broader UFO lore. The Black Mausoleum In the 17th century, Scotland was undergoing an intense religious struggle when King Charles introduced the common book of prayer and declared all opposition to the book an act of treason. A draconian lawyer named George Mackenzie was responsible for putting down the opposition. Mackenzie, who was also the Lord Advocate during the rule of Charles II, quickly earned a reputation as one of the most vicious persecutors of the Covenanters, the people who rose up and signed the National Covenant in 1638. Mackenzie's brutal and unfeeling treatment of the protesters earned him the moniker Bluity Mackenzie. Many Covenanters were imprisoned in a section of Greyfriars Kirkyard in Edinburgh, where he delighted in their torture. Guards were allowed to beat the Covenanters at will, and their heads would eventually decorate the spiked gate. After his death, Mackenzie was entombed in a mausoleum in Greyfriars Kirkyard, which has been the site of numerous desecrations. In 1999, a homeless man sought shelter in Mackenzie's mausoleum and fell through the floor creating a hole that can still be seen to this day. After the disruption in the mausoleum, people reported poltergeist activity around the tomb, including scratches and bruises, all attributed to Mackenzie's vengeful spirit. Apparently, he was as horrific in death as he was in life. However, this did not scare a duo of teens who broke into the tomb in 2004 and removed several unidentified remains, even beheading one corpse and using the skull like a hand puppet. 
They were found and tried under a centuries-old grave-robbing law described as a violation of sepulcher. Due to the many violations, the doors to the mausoleum remain locked, but visitors can still peek through and recite the old children's rhyme, Bluity Mackenzie, come out if ye dare, lift this neck and draw the bar. The legend of the Black Mausoleum and its vengeful spirit endures, a chilling reminder of the cruelty that once stained Scotland's history. The Hornet Spook Light Bobbing and bouncing along a dirt road in northeast Oklahoma is the Hornet Spook Light, a paranormal mystery for more than a century. Described most often as an orange ball of light, the orb travels from east to west along a four-mile gravel road, long called the Devil's Promenade by area locals. The spook light, which often appears without warning, remains one of the most enduring and mysterious phenomena in the state. This remote area near the small town of Hornet is a place where legends are born, or possibly made up. The long gravel road stretches through rolling hills and dense woods, a setting that seems tailor-made for creepy encounters. It's along this desolate stretch that the Hornet spook light makes its ghostly appearances, which I guess makes more sense than showing up in the middle of town. The spook light was first noticed in the 19th century, though Native American legends suggest it might have been even earlier. According to some accounts, it was along the infamous Trail of Tears in 1836 when the lights were first seen. Observers would see it moving erratically, bobbing and weaving through the night sky, sometimes approaching the stunned tribesmen before darting away. The mystery of the Hornet spook light reached its peak in the 1950s, a period of intense interest in science fiction and space exploration. Researchers, tourists, and paranormal enthusiasts flocked to the Devil's Promenade, hoping to catch a glimpse of the elusive light. But despite numerous sightings and photographic evidence, no concrete explanation has emerged. But there are some theories. They range from decaying organic matter causing a will-o'-the-wisp effect to refracted headlights from the nearby highway. Sounds plausible, although this doesn't explain why the lights were being seen prior to the invention of the automobile. Anyway, the spook light continues to draw visitors to this day, each hoping to experience the eerie glow for themselves. And over the years, this phenomenon has become a cultural icon synonymous with the town of Hornet, inspiring folklore, local pride, and robust souvenir sales as this enchanting mystery continues to endure. The Great Amherst Mystery In the late 19th century, a small town in Nova Scotia became the epicenter of a chilling and inexplicable phenomenon. The Great Amherst Mystery, involving a young woman named Esther Cox, remains one of the most compelling cases of alleged poltergeist activity in history. Amherst, Nova Scotia, is a quiet town with a rich history and a close-knit community. But in the late 1870s, its peace was shattered by a series of bizarre events centered around Esther Cox. The Cox family home became the stage for inexplicable occurrences that would baffle investigators and horrify residents. The strange happenings began after Esther survived a traumatic incident involving a male friend who afterwards claimed to have suffered a psychotic break. Not long after, Esther started experiencing terrifying events, objects moving on their own, mysterious fires, and violent physical attacks by ghostly forces. The poltergeist activity would follow her wherever she went, even when she stayed with her relatives. Walter Hubble, an actor and part-time paranormal investigator moved in with the Cox family to document the occurrences. His detailed accounts of floating objects and Esther's torment at the hands of ghostly apparitions were published in a book that left readers spellbound. Despite numerous witnesses and extensive documentation, skeptics dismissed the events as hoaxes, possibly orchestrated by Esther herself. The climax of the Amherst mystery occurred when the phenomena escalated to physical assaults. Esther was attacked with increasing ferocity, leaving her beaten, bruised, and terrified. The townsfolk soon got in on the act. It wasn't long before dozens of residents came forward with their own experiences of the supernatural events. It sounds like it's time to call in the Ghostbusters. The paranormal investigators did their thing, but no conclusive explanation was ever found. 
After that, the poltergeist activity gradually subsided, and Esther's life returned to a semblance of normalcy. Yet, despite zero evidence, other than the observations of a mostly out-of-work actor and paranormal investigator, the mystery has endured. To this day, the townspeople in Amherst remain fascinated by ghosts and unexplained mysteries, which probably explains why the biggest audience for this channel is Amherst. So what do you make of these unsolved mysteries? Be sure to leave your questions and answers in the comments section below. And if you made it this far, thanks for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks again, and I hope to see you next time.